When the time comes for a helping hand, we're America's choice in home care. When you or your loved ones need assistance, visiting angels will be there. Morning, everybody. I see that it is 11 o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started while uh, Sheila, who I will introduce in just a moment, gets her slideshow ready for us. So welcome, as I said, this is Mary Ellen Wilson. I am your business development manager here at Visiting Angels. At Visiting Angels, we have offices in Gaithersburg, Washington, D.C., Silver Spring, Edgewater, Maryland, and we service uh, the whole metropolitan DC area. So we do provide home care services to our older adults to allow them to age gracefully at home. Today, I am really excited about our coffee chat. And, we're, and if you are a first time joiner, coffee chatter, and I hope you have your coffee, yeah. Uh, what we do here is every other week, we have started these coffee chats. We've really missed during the whole COVID uh, pandemic. We've missed being able to go out into uh, the public and see our clients and see our care partners. So we decided that we would meet you where you are and uh, harness this virtual technology so that we could still at least see you um, electronically, digitally, if you will. So that's how our coffee chat started. Every other week we provide, uh, we bring these to you live and we have a wonderful speaker and we think we talk about topics of interest to our older adults and their loved ones. So a few housekeeping tips before I introduce our guest today. And the first one is you will see a chat box down. If you are Zooming with us, you're going to see a chat box. As uh, Sheila is talking about our topic of Alzheimer's and dementia today, it is very likely that you may have a question or two. So be sure to put it right in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we are going to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, we are also streaming live on Facebook. That's always exciting. Hello to my Facebook friends. So to all of you, if you too have questions, then all that you need to do is put your question in the comment section. And then we have the wizard behind the curtain, Brittany, who is uh, really running the show. She will let us know what questions appear on our Facebook pages. So I would love to introduce Sheila. And Sheila looks like she's looking around, figuring out her PowerPoint. Are you good to know? <laughs> because we don't need slides, because I know you know what yeah. you're talking about. So let That's me introduce true. You. Let me introduce you first, and then we'll see if we can't figure out your PowerPoint uh, issues here. So Sheila is uh, Sheila Griffith is the program manager at the uh, National Capital Area Alzheimer's Association. She is tasked with delivering educational programs to the community at large in both Montgomery County and Washington, D.C. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you are also a nurse. Is that correct, a registered nurse? No. no, I'm a no, nursing home administrator, but not, not a nurse. Oh, sorry. It's probably better to be a nurse right now. <laughs> nursing home administrator. And yeah. her background is in long-term care and senior housing. That's what you get for not reading, but just glimpsing. Oh. <laughs> so we are really excited. You know, I have found that one of the biggest issues, it seems, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues for our, our older Americans, our older adults, is cognitive issues, dementia, Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of confusion uh, around what is Alzheimer's, what is dementia, what is the difference? 
So why don't we begin, if, if, if that's all right with you, is kind of going over what is dementia? That sounds great, Mary Ellen. And so just to, to let everybody know, uh, yeah, I'm a program manager for the Alzheimer's Association. And this is exactly what we do is try to um, educate people on what um, is happening with Alzheimer's disease. And so today we're we're really chatting. You're helping me go through my program, which is um, really going to be wonderful. And this is a program that uh, is designed to help people understand more about Alzheimer's disease and the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So I think that between um, our, the questions we're, we're going to uh, talk to each other about and what we've both seen in the industry um, at Visiting Angels and at the Alzheimer's Association, I think we're going to give a really good view of um, what this disease is like and, and hopefully get everybody to have a better understanding of um, uh, what they're seeing, if they are seeing any signs of this, and um, how to understand it better. So yeah, let's talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. Those are terms that a lot of people just sort of use interchangeably. Um, one means the same. Does it mean the same? Is it the same thing? Um, and I'm, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And part, part of what I'm sharing is um, an actual program that I usually do in person when we don't have a pandemic. And so, um, you know, now we're not doing that anymore. And uh, it's just uh, interesting to how we modify it to make it, um, you know, for everybody to, to actually um, enjoy. So you're not gonna see the full program today, uh, but you will see um, some of the most important parts. So while, why don't I go ahead and I'm gonna show you Alzheimer's and dementia, and we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna have a comparison and talk about the differences. So I have to fast forward through here, and I'm sorry about that, but it's better than sitting for an hour program, I think. <laughs> So <laughs> that's okay. Uh, you know, I know you're going to hit the highlights. So wonderful. That's exactly it. And, and so, as I said, a lot of people feel like those terms are interchangeable and they're really not. Um, they're um, actually quite separate. And so somebody who asks, um, somebody who is experiencing maybe some of um, what we might consider symptoms um, is experiencing dementia. And um, wh what happens is if you are having uh, any of these, and you can see the first bullet, um, it's a general term for a collection of symptoms that are severe enough to interfere with your daily life. So there are things with uh, problems with memory, um, pr problems with thinking, problems with carrying out tasks. All of a sudden, uh, you know, the things you used to take for granted that you could find your way home from the grocery store without even thinking, um, it doesn't happen as easily anymore. Um, and so problems with thinking and planning and definitely with memory. Those are, those are probably symptoms of dementia unless there's something else happening. Then talking about Alzheimer's, so dementia is like an umbrella term. It's a giant umbrella, is how we describe it, and it has a lot of, uh, there, there are symptoms that m make you think something might be wrong. Then underneath the umbrella, believe it or not, there are 60 to 70 diseases, and Alzheimer's disease is one of those diseases. So in, in a, uh, really in a nutshell, dementia is a symptom and it's an umbrella term to describe what might be happening to the person. And then Alzheimer's is actually a disease, just like uh, Lewy body's dementia is a disease, vascular dis dementia is a disease. Um, and one of the most important things we say is that Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging. So it is a, a brain disease and a progressive brain disease at that. So, uh, and probably everybody knows who's listening is that we don't have a cure uh, for Alzheimer's disease at this time. So I'm going to get to a slide that shows you a little bit more of um, all of these diseases that I'm talking about. You that know, fall under that umbrella. While yeah, while you're, you're finding that slide, I just have to say 70 different diseases under the dementia umbrella. Yes. I have no idea, and Alzheimer's is but one. It's interesting that Alzheimer's seems to get all of the, um, shall we say, publicity. You know, most of us, when we think of dementia, we think of Alzheimer's, but there's so much more going on. 
Well, and one of the things, and you know this, Mary Ellen, and I know Visiting Angels is, is always a proponent of this, is getting a diagnosis. So something is wrong. You need help. Uh, you need assistance. Um, you, you sense something's wrong. Your loved ones will definitely see something is going on. And, and let's try to figure out what, why are you having these symptoms of dementia? And it leads to getting underneath that umbrella and getting a diagnosis for one of those diseases that's under there. Now, for some diseases, there are medications that can actually help those symptoms of dementia and maybe help a person live with the disease, whatever they're experiencing. Um, and there are drugs um, for Alzheimer's disease that can help the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. But the point that we like to make is that if you stay up top and just experience this dementia and you never know why and it just gets worse, um, you really put yourself at a disadvantage. But because getting that diagnosis can, there may be interventions that um, you can you can live a, a, a more of a, a, a life that you'd like to lead, maybe more independently, uh, or maybe um, with a little help uh, instead of waiting until the the other shoe drops, and maybe you're in the full throes of uh, one of the the diseases under that umbrella. So. Um, some, some of those diseases, and there's even, um, I always uh, tell people this when we're talking in, in person, um, has anybody ever heard of a, a dementia related, um, having dementia and it's actually reversible? Uh, so uh, obviously Alzheimer's disease is a disease, it's progressive, it's not reversible. But sometimes when you're experiencing dementia, if you go to the doctor to try to see what's wrong, it could be something like, have you ever heard of having a uh, fluid on the brain where, uh, you know, if you have a procedure uh, where the, the fluid is drained, maybe the dementia could be reversed. Um, a lot of times in nursing homes, I'd seen people who, you know, landed in the hospital because they were found on the kitchen floor by their neighbor and they had been on the kitchen floor for, you know, two or three days without food or water or, or care and uh, because they'd fallen and they develop a little dementia. They don't know what day it is. They don't know why this happened. They don't know where they were. They don't know what what, you know, what became before the fall and, and why they're even in the hospital. And they might land in, our, in a nursing home. And when you have somebody there who then seems like they have dementia, but you give them three meals a day, you give them medications that they need. And, you know, in a, in a little while, you might see some of that dementia improve and, uh, and their thinking improve and their memory improve. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting symptom of something and getting a diagnosis is the best uh, course of action. Wonderful, okay. So next we could talk about risk factors if that sounds like uh, something that we um, would be interested in. We usually Absolutely. go through that also. Yeah, okay. are there specific risk factors? That's interesting, yeah. We definitely there are, and I'm gonna put you on the spot, Mary Ellen, okay? <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, this is this is a in this program. I have like I think there's about four called test your knowledge questions. I call them quiz questions when I'm in front of a, a bigger audience, and I, you know, we usually have raise of raise hands or whatever. So we'll put you on the spot here. Right, um, I'm game. <laughs> you've got a. I know you have a good knowledge base. So what do you no. think is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? So there's three choices, genetics, family history, history and age. age. I am going to go with genetics. Great. Okay. Well, that's not the right answer because this is a trick question, but I'll tell you, I'm going to hit on genetics and um, it, okay. It's saying no. So the trick question here is the greatest known risk. These are all risks. So you're right, genetics is correct. Family history is also correct. But the real answer here is age, um, because although um, it's not a, Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging, um, it's, the big, it's the greatest risk factor. Um, so there are uh, mo more people over the age of 65 who have Alzheimer's disease than younger. So there's a lot, there are people who have younger onset Alzheimer's, and that's obviously before 65. And this is very debilitating, but it's a, it's a much smaller number than um, after 65, uh, the risk of Alzheimer's doubles every five years. Wow. And then wow. after 85, um, there's 32% of uh, people 85 and older will be living with Alzheimer's disease. Now that's a terrible statistic and 
always a big downer for an in-person, uh, you know, program like this. But I always like to say, you know, it says 32 uh, percent, 85 and older. But it means that two thirds don't have it. So one third probably will have it, 85 and older. But two thirds of us won't have it. So that's how we have to think of it. Is not it's not normal to have uh, memory loss and to have problems with thinking and planning and getting a diagnosis like Alzheimer's disease. It's not a no normal part of aging. And and to please try to 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 get some help or some uh, a diagnosis where maybe there are some interventions for you. Okay. That that's a and it's an important one I think for people to understand. This is another um, very good statistic to to understand. So populations at highest risk. So there are different um, risks at different populations. So Hispanics are about one and a half times um, more likely to experience Alzheimer's and other dementias. African Americans are twice as likely. That's the highest group that that could experience Alzheimer's and other dementias. And unfortunately, you and I are in this category, almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. So that's a, that's a big statistic also. So we don't like any of those bullets there, but it is the, it is the truth of how Alzheimer's is affecting uh, Americans um, right now. I don't know if you have any questions. Usually people no, say to me, so why are women? Yeah, people well, usually women. say what? That, they say, why women? Why women have a, such a higher risk? And it's a, that's, that's a good question. And um, the, a lot of people w might say, well, there's um, more women uh, live longer. And so there's probably more women, if you think about the 85 years and older statistic I had earlier. So m more of those 85 year olds are probably women. Uh, and that, that makes a higher pool of women uh, available to get the disease. But they say that there's something else about women too that we're getting it at a higher uh, incidence than men. So it's definitely something we're studying now and trying to, um, trying to figure out why. Good to know. Hmm. All right. You're a little bit frozen, so we'll go over our next risk factor. But while you are unfreezing, I will mention that uh, what I have noticed is the most often cited diagnosis within our clients is dementia. So having age as the biggest risk factor does make sense uh, when you look at that's who our, our clientele is as well. And for some reason, Sheila is a little bit frozen. Let's see. The beauty of technology. See, if we were in person, this would never happen. I have a feeling she's going to leave and come back on. So it is interesting that, uh, that women do have a higher percentage. Oh, there she is. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. What? I guess that was me, huh? I'm not sure what happened you there. You froze up, and then we lost you. Sorry to say. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. Wow. <laughs> no, hey, modern technology, That's sometimes it happens. So I was just noting that it's interesting that you said 32% of people aged over 85. And it's interesting because our highest incidence of diagnosis for our clients is also dementia. So it just was kind of interesting to me. And it's probably more elderly, uh, more 80 or 85 and older, um, where maybe you've lost a spouse and you need that extra help to, to come in and help you uh, if you had a well spouse before, or that that's usually our caregiver, right? Is our, our spouse or right. a loved one. That's great. Okay, so go ahead. This, so this, pay, this uh, slide just shows that, you know, we talked about age. Um, we talked, uh, we didn't really talk about family history. A lot of people ask uh, if I have somebody in my family, parent or sibling, uh, what does that mean for me if they had the, the disease? And it does mean that you may be at higher risk. It's definitely something you should talk to your doctor about and try to find out if you are at risk for the disease. You, your answer, the um, genetics is uh, the, a big one too that's being studied right now. Uh, there's two types of genes, risk genes and deterministic genes. And um, there are uh, genes that are associated uh, with Alzheimer's that is um, unfortunate that it really brings on the disease. Um, 
And we talked about uh, having uh, Hispanics, African Americans, and women all at higher risk also for the disease, unfortunately. So, Sheila, let me ask you, we're talking about all the different risk factors. Are there things that we can do to mitigate our risks? Obviously, these are, are not mitigatable, uh, but are there things that we can do in our daily life that will help uh, prevent the onset? There are, and that's a great question. Thank you for, uh, for asking it. So if you look at um, age, family history, genes, uh, and you know, just, just being a woman, those are all things that are difficult, or your race, that's difficult to change. But we call, um, we call all of those factors uh, maybe that we, we can't change as much, but there, there are lifestyle factors that we can certainly change. So all of those things, if, if you think about um, incidences of diabetes, um, incidences of heart disease, um, a high blood pressure, those are all, and, and actually this is a separate program, but we talk about all of those types of diseases that to some extent you can uh, pre maybe prevent, but also minimize. You can eat right, you can exercise, and you can lower blood pressure, lower weight. Um, you might be able to uh, actually affect your diabetes. Um, there's a lot of people just through diet um, can affect their diabetes. All of those things are going to help your brain. And um, if you're uh, helping your brain stay healthy, then you are going to um, hopefully uh, really uh, try, you, at that point your brain will be more healthy and you'll have less risk. Now, some people say to me, but I do eat healthy and I still have, you know, I've been diagnosed with, with this disease. Well, it could be something else that's working, um, but uh, like uh, something hereditary or, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things we don't know about Alzheimer's disease and why people get it, but we always advocate for having a healthy brain and um, a healthy body and therefore a healthy brain. So it really all comes down to lifestyle. One of the programs I do that is it's talking about healthy living, it talks about um, research saying if there's one thing that you can do for your brain, because there's a lot of things you can do for it, but the, the, the thing that is most important that you can do to help your brain is physical exercise, believe it or not. So the blood flow is really what you have to keep going and uh, keep flowing. Um, I think it's something like 25% uh, of your, uh, the blood that flows through every heartbeat is going up to your brain. So if you think about a blockage, you know, that is not allowing all of that um, blood to get up there and do what it needs to do, then I'm, I'm sure you're going you're gonna to experience some diminished, um, you know, brain activity. So, but in that program, it, it's a fun program. And we talk about not only physical exercise, but uh, uh, diet, health, nutrition, healthy eating. And we talk about um, social engagement is very important to keeping a healthy brain active and um, cognitive activity. So all the brain games we can play. Um, right. And actually we're doing something right now where we are engaging socially and we're also, I hope, learning something new. Um, so, you know, you're keeping your brain active if you're tuned right. to this program right now. There so. you go. Tune into the coffee chats <laughs> every other week. Yes. <laughs> all right. So should we talk, are we good with risk factors? Should we move on to the three stages? Um, I think we will. And I, I just encourage people to put any questions in the chat, as you said earlier. We and are getting some. So we good. will not definitely have some Q&A coming. Great. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to get to my um, three stages here um, as well as I can. And I'm going to play a video from an expert at the Alzheimer's Association who really um, talks about, um, oh, that was my video. Okay, let me go back to her. So th this is an expert at the Alzheimer's Association and we are, all of our programs are just like this. They're PowerPoint presentations embedded with videos. And so we try to keep all of our, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a program manager expert but I'm not a scientist or a doctor. And so these are really great videos to hear from uh, doctors and scientists. So let's hear about the three stages of Alzheimer's now. Oh, I, am I, sh I'm not sharing my ski screen. I think you I got to go back to your screen. Oh, I am. Okay. <laughs> but, we need the, um, but we do need the sound. Okay. So uh, let's see if I can make sure that we get the sound. 
and you might need to be a co-host. There it is. Because no, she, Brittany did it. I just wasn't paying attention. So here we go. Let's try this. All right. Alzheimer's affects everyone differently. As a result, it's difficult to place a person in a specific stage of the disease. However, there are three general stages that are commonly referred to as early, middle, and late stage Alzheimer's. In a medical context, you may hear these stages referred to as mild, moderate, and severe. In the early stage of Alzheimer's, an individual may be able to function independently. However, they may start noticing more frequent memory lapses. Friends and family may also begin to notice difficulties in the person, and a healthcare provider may be able to detect problems in memory or concentration by conducting a detailed medical interview. Middle stage Alzheimer's is typically the longest stage and can last for many years. Damage to the brain cells can make it difficult to express thoughts and perform routine tasks, and this can lead to increased feelings of frustration and anger. In the final stage of the disease, an individual loses the ability to hold a conversation, control their movements, or respond to the environment around them. Cognitive skills, that is their memory, thinking, and reasoning skills, continue to decline, and this can lead to personality changes and need for round-the-clock care. So I'm going to keep this uh, screen up because I think it's, it's worth just uh, looking at and thinking about as, as we talk, but um, I, I would be interested to hear um, from visiting angels, like where do you really find your client base? Is it when do people really need you? Probably not the early stage, um, maybe the middle stage and, and probably more into the late stage, I would think. It's interesting because uh, definitely the middle stage uh, because mm -hmm. Uh, many times the unpaid caregiver, the spouse or adult child is the one taking care of the loved one that is having forgetfulness or, you know, some confusion and personality differences and they need a break. So they'll yep. call us so that they can have a break a couple of times a week. As we get into the later stages, yeah, we definitely try to keep um, clients at home as long as possible. So then it's more companion care, someone there with them, um, helping them like, like your chart says around mm -hmm. the clock assistance. Yeah. I, and I we think, can help in facilities as well. So we do see, we run the gamut. And I think that's where, you know, the key is trying to, so many people would like to stay at home and then having that, uh, that assistance. So, very briefly, I can say that the early stage is very difficult to detect. Um, your, your, your spouse or your loved one or your caregiver may say, I, I, something's not right with you. And, and a lot of people are in denial at this stage. And it's, you don't probably need assistance yet, um, but your, um, things, are, things are happening. Um, you're forgetting things that you normally would always remember. Um, some people, uh, we, we say this a lot, that they sort of bypass the stage altogether. They were, they were in it, and they never knew they were in it, the early stage, and they're all of a sudden really needing help or really needing a diagnosis or, you know, whatever uh, in the middle stage. That's when it becomes real apparent where, uh, you know, you have to really um, maybe have more assistance. Um, your behaviors, um, maybe if they're forgetful, could actually lead to uh, dangerous situations at times. So um, maybe doing less and um, having more assistance doing what you are doing. Um, but really, um, that's when a lot of people say they feel like there's a personality change with their loved one because of those behavioral changes. So we see a lot of that. Um, the communication gets more difficult and the behaviors that were never there before start to happen or were there and actually get worse. They become worse behaviors than they were before. So um, that, it's a difficult stage, the middle stage. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to a client yesterday, uh, the client's adult daughter, and we were talking about her dad and she mentioned that he, he does have some dementia. He had a stroke a few years ago and she mentioned that Sometimes he has started talking, like some days he'll wake up and talk like a baby, baby talk. Mm -hmm. And then other days he's himself and then he reverts back again. Is that something that you commonly see? 
It, and it affects everyone differently. It's really, um, it, that's interesting. And uh, it could be I, I, something like that happening where it goes back and forth, whatever it is, I would definitely give the doctor a call and let them know whether you're seeing a primary care physician and you're waiting to get a diagnosis, or maybe you have a neurologist and you have a diagnosis for your loved one. That's an interesting thing that the doctor should and, and would know, uh, wants to know. Uh, so yeah, that it, it, it strikes everybody differently. Um, there are people that, um, you know, they, they become more and more forgetful uh, and they get angry. They get angry at you, their loved one, and they get angry at themselves and they're angry at themselves. So that's why they get angry at you. And uh, they, you know, sort of lash out in that anger. Now, this might not have been an angry person to begin with, but they could, um, you know, do anything. Like I've heard of people using bad language, never use bad language in their life. And then because of this anger, and I think it's also fear, you know, you, That's you go through Alzheimer's disease and you never stop being you, you're still you and you still know something's not right. And uh, I've heard people ask in nursing, when I worked in nursing homes, ask me what's wrong with me? You know, they're, they're in the middle stage, they're well into it. And you know, probably been told they can't remember. And then they wake up one day and they, it's, they, there's something wrong. They know something's very wrong and they, they, they don't know what it is. And so they'll be asking about that. So yeah, I think all those symptoms like talking baby talk or um, not doing things for themselves, um, things like that changing, any kind of change a doctor would want to know about. Okay. So I'm wondering if we should ask some, um, if we should look at some questions or do you want to go to resources first? Uh, sure, we could look at quite if there, I mean, a lot of people have questions around now. I mean, the, in the late stage yeah. is the really hardest stage. As you, you said earlier, uh, a lot of people uh, can't stay at home. Uh, they need to have somebody uh, like uh, visiting angels or some, somebody there with them 24 hours hours a day. And if that's not possible, they may have to be uh, in a facility to have care 24 hours a day. So that's, that's what it leads to. And it's very, very difficult. So yeah, we could have questions if that if that works, if you see any that yeah. would be good for now. So here, our first uh, question from Judy, what's the best type of doctor to go to for a diagnosis? Well, I th a lot of people ask that question, and I think the key is, is finding a neurologist. That's who you probably will be referred to, but this is how you might start. So anybody who's over 65 um, and is Medicare eligible has um, what's called a well, a well visit, a wellness visit, and it's one visit a year with your general practitioner. That should be um, your wellness. Hey, how are you doing? How's your weight? How's your blood pressure? How's everything? And uh, the Alzheimer's Association is advocating that you also be asked, hey, how's your memory? And now uh, when, I have a, when I have a live audience in front of me, I always ask people who are 65 and older, have you ever had a memory test? Has somebody said that to you in your wellness visit? Mm -hmm. It's one or two people, you know, out of many. And most people don't even know what I'm talking about, a wellness visit. But it is actually something that you're, you might be getting it and your ge general practitioner is not even saying it's a wellness visit. It's just your annual but in that visit, you could be talking about your memory. If you have concerns about your memory, if you're, you know, all of us slow down as we age and we may not have Alzheimer's disease, we may not have dementia as a symptom, but we're having trouble coming up with names. I, I think we all find that, you know, as, as we grow older, we don't run as fast and maybe our memory doesn't work as quickly to come up with names or dates or something. So there are normal uh, aging um, uh, memory problems, but um, a general practitioner can give you even a simple memory test um, and some of them can and will, and it can be uh, something like, um, uh, I'm going to mention three objects, um, apple, nickel, and chair. And then I'm going to talk to you about your blood pressure because your blood pressure is really high. And I'm really, um, you know, want you to try to do some of these things that I'm telling you to lower your blood pressure and to get more sleep and to sleep better. And by the way, what were those three objects I mentioned? Mm. You know, Mary Ellen? 
<laughs> yeah, apple nickel chair. All right, yeah. Because I knew that was coming, so I kept saying them in my head. And, well, and I want to put a plug into visiting it for visiting angels too, because you guys do memory screens too. So it doesn't have to be. You could wander into an event that the visiting angels are doing and get a memory screening and maybe see that everything's fine or no, there's something you should follow up on. Then go to your general practitioner and then that person can do something possibly, or they might just refer you right to a neurologist. And then I always say, make sure it's a neurologist you like, because if this is Alzheimer's disease, you're going to be visiting that person, you know, quite a lot and you need to be able to trust them and, and um, you know, really trust their opinion. All right. Uh, next question. I have a sibling. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer, but the first thing they told me was dementia. Long story short, flu shots affected her considerably. Wow. I see her, but she looks like an autism patient. Medications were removed and family went non-conventional treatment. She was diagnosed 2014, but she's still walking, eating, but very agitated and she's off all medication. At this point, what else can be done? We have been researching and it seems that flu shots affected her considerably. Very frustrating. Thanks for the oh. hints. Oh my goodness. I'm writing that down because um, I've not have had that as a point, uh, you know, of discussion before. So that's very, very interesting. Of course, I've heard the, the, whatever the link is between flu shots and autism, but with children, I thought more than anything, but um, I, I don't know if this is, you know, how that could have happened, but it does sound like from what she's describing that it's an Alzheimer's like, uh, you know, um, behaviors. So I would hope that the neurologist can hopefully, you know, try to, um, you know, give, give some advice there. If it's, if it's the Alzheimer's route there, then it, then they know what that looks like and they actually can do a brain scan. They used to say back in, uh, you know, a hundred years ago when they were just really figuring out what Alzheimer's was and, and how it was a progressive brain disease, they'd say they could never diagnose it. You had to have an autopsy. You'd have to, the person would have to, uh, you know, obviously wow. pass away and then the autopsy of the brain would show that, yes, that was Alzheimer's. That's not true anymore. They're they are able to um, take uh, you know scans and different things and see uh, what the brain looks like. The brain might shrink a little. They can tell by shrinkage that um, that there's a brain disease going on. So I wonder if they could figure out better. Is it definitely Alzheimer's? And then there are some drugs that help symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, but when you have uh, somebody who's affected so profoundly by the flu shot, I, I wonder if there's, I don't know enough about that, that issue and that avenue, but that, that's, I, I hope that, I would hope the neurologist does. Okay. All right. Let's take one more, then we'll go to resources and go back to Q&A. Great. How typical is anger as a symptom? I think it, I think it's pretty typical. If you asked uh, most people who are caregivers or, um, people who paid caregivers or unpaid caregivers, that can, that can rise up. Anger can rise up even in a really even keeled personality uh, uh, from time to time. And I think I touched on it a little. That's my opinion is that I think if, if something's happening to you and you're fearful of it and you're discovering that it, it is Alzheimer's disease, say, and, um, and you're angry, why me? Why am I here getting this and you're still in the early stages or you're in the middle stages um, and it's it doesn't seem fair and and you're fearful in your anger and so I think anger is a very typical um, symptom uh, along with like the memory loss and the and the planning and the, the executive function like trying to get from A to B you know and how it was never a problem even things like um, and we have a we have a program about this where we talk about behaviors and and um, and, and, and different symptoms like that. But when, when you always used to bake the, your favorite cake and it was your mother's recipe and your grandmother's and you've been doing it your whole life and all of a sudden you can't remember what goes into it. And even when you follow the recipe written, sometimes it's difficult to know where am I in the recipe. That can be very angering to know that you did this your whole life right. without even thinking about it and now you can't do it. And, right. and that's, that's very frustrating, I'd imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, let's um, talk about resources. And I just want to mention, you had mentioned, Sheila, that uh, Visiting Angels, we do do free memory screenings. And we actually had one scheduled in March. And uh, with the COVID pandemic, obviously, it was, it needs to be rescheduled. So certainly we will let everyone know when our next one is scheduled for sure. So in the meantime, where do we go for more information? I don't, it, will Brittany share it or um, do we have a resource slide or I can go back and get my slide too, but. I think we, I think it's yours. You have oh, okay. All right, let me, let me share again then. So really what I, what I would like people to do today if they haven't done it already is to go to um, our, uh, oh, I'm not, Oh, there we go. To go to our website, alz.org. And I'm just going to fast forward through the rest of this program. We, we um, touched on all of the very There are currently several drugs here. that are FDA. I want to just get to my resource page. So at alz.org, we really try to, it's, it's a huge website and it talks about everything from, you just saw clinical studies to advancing Alzheimer's research, to um, really opportunities that you can uh, help the association or participate in the, um, in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. So we have probably, you've heard of us, maybe not for a program today like you, we're, we're just experiencing, but for our fundraising. So that's our main mission is to raise funds for research um, to uh, find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. But in the meantime, uh, we also have all of these resources to help as people are maybe in the disease or wanting to learn more about the disease. So um, we have a great helpline, a 24 seven helpline uh, that uh, you can call anytime. And if you're, especially if you're a caregiver and you're really maybe experiencing uh, behaviors that you never saw before in your loved one and it's just exhausting and, uh, and you don't know what to do and um, you can call this helpline. And we have people who are uh, trained uh, at the social work level to give you really good answers and good resources on, on what you can do next. We can't send somebody out like Visiting Angels can and come help you the next morning or you know the, the next day after that. But we can, um, a lot of times what they'll do with this 800 number is put you in touch with me in Montgomery County. And then I can help you figure out what your local resources are and, and what your next move is. But if you could go to the, um, the alz.org uh, website, I'm, I'm sure you'd find there's something for everyone there. Um, and if you did want to see other programs like this, you could find that also. So there's education programs on the alz.org um, website. And I will say that Montgomery County seems to have a very robust um, program for memory care. I know that they have memory cafes and different educational outreach programs. So I think that there is a lot, if you are lucky enough to be in Montgomery County, there is uh, quite a bit of information out there for you. You, and you, thank you for saying that. Yes, that's part of what I do besides this is outreach, this is education, uh, but I also oversee um, all of our support groups in Montgomery County as well as um, our memory cafes. So support groups are for caregivers. Uh, they meet um, usually monthly, sometimes more frequently than once a month. And then the memory cafes are people for people with the diagnosis where we um, do some reminiscing and different activities and it's a great way to be social with people who are also experiencing memory loss in some way or some memory impairment. And um, we have, we have fun, you know, it's really, it's a nice way to spend, spend an hour or two a month. Spend an hour or two. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's see if we, can you die from dementia? Mm. It's not, it's sad. I, I think to, to say yes, uh, because there, if, if you have any of those diseases that are under the dementia umbrella, that dementia is indicating something is wrong and, uh, and, and it's indicating, let's get to the bottom of it, the diagnosis. So, um, 
There, it'll, it, it could be a disease like Parkinson's um, that uh, we're probably all familiar with. Uh, it has a lot of physical tremors, uh, and, uh, but it also can have dementia too. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of these diseases that you can die from. Maybe you won't die, you're, it won't say dementia uh, as the cause of death, but, it, it, but it's, it's leading to one of those diseases more than likely. Okay. All right. And um, I am going to ask Brittany if she sees any on our Facebook page while I am looking through this. And in the chat box, there is um, a, a lot of different information from some of the different uh, participants. Okay. Wow, I think we got three more. Hi, Mary Ellen. We haven't received any, any comments on Facebook yet. Okay, great. None? Okay, so we're good what, to go. What about in the, I see in the Q&A too, have you guys, have we looked in there? Because I yes. say, I, I think the chat is always a great way to put information like that in there. And I appreciate when people do that because uh, it like the question about the, the link between flu shots and Alzheimer's disease I've never heard that before, and I'm so yeah. glad that person offered that because I I'm going to look into that and try to see what I can learn from that. But um, I think we can all learn from, we don't know what we can learn from. <laughs> we have to just read it and listen and, and yeah. ask questions. So thank you, everyone. And there seems to be for uh, Julio, who is the caregiver of mom, it's a lot of work, with, but with a lot of love. Um, it's the lifestyle that they're working on. Exercise, light exercises, or brain tap. Food is very important. Lots of fatty acids, coconut oil. Um, that's really neat. But again, this, this was the patient with the the client with the uh, flu shot issue. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, you know, but that you're really on the right track. And that's one of that other program I was talking about healthy living. We talk a lot about food and we talk about um, the Mediterranean diet, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about before yes. where yes. Uh, really more lean meats, olive oil, um, a lot of vegetables. Um, and then there's also the DASH diet, which is um, to help lower uh, blood pressure. And uh, it's a great diet for anybody, even if you don't have high blood pressure. So there are, and we're bombarded, I think, with all of these different types of eat, uh, eating plans and like the keto diet and everything else. So you have to be, you know, just really knowledgeable and trying to pick out what works for you. What's the best thing for you? For most of us, maybe over a certain age, it's probably right maintaining or losing weight, not gaining weight. So no more, uh, not as much fast food or processed food you have to really be careful of and, uh, and trying to, um, you know, limit your calories and, uh, but still, you know, get enough nutrition. Right. So Julio is also asking what else is out there for support. I need more help with, for, with support groups. And so I'm guessing you would refer him to the, um, to your website. Yeah. I, and also I'll put in, um, in the chat box, my um, email address, and I'd be happy to anybody who lives in Montgomery County, or even if you live in um, somewhere in the national capital area. So Northern Virginia, Montgomery County, PG County, um, Southern Maryland and Washington, our chapter sort of covers everything. So if I don't cover it, then I have a colleague that does. So um, I, can, I can steer you to the right support group. Now, right now, the support groups are almost all online. So it doesn't matter where you live, you can tune in you know, anytime that's convenient. But at the Alzheimer's Association, we hope eventually we'll get back to in-person and then we'll sort of, you know, be back to our different little territories. But, but right now there's a lot of support groups that there's, a, we have a support group that is actually uh, specifically for younger caregivers. So for people 40 and younger who are caring for somebody with a disease, and you wouldn't believe that, you, maybe you wouldn't think that that might be an important distinction, but it is. For the person who is a young, younger, 40 and under, uh, you're really, you've got small kids, you've got different yeah. responsibilities than somebody who's maybe more towards 60 or even retired, uh, you know, so there, we find that it, it really is helpful to have um, a few of these younger caregiver support groups because the issues are 
sometimes they're the same, but a lot of times they're a little more complicated and it's helpful. Yeah, and it's interesting because we just did a uh, coffee chat on the sandwich generation, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. exact person that you're talking yes. about. Okay, so Mary would like to know, um, Mary is our RN doing the memory screenings for visiting angels. Are those tools really effective? For memory screening? We have used the BAS. Is that an effective tool? Well, I think any kind of uh, tool, I don't know what the tool is that, um, that Visiting Angels uses for the memory screenings, but I think just the simple one that I did, as a, that's a very simple memory test, just three items, keep talking. I've had people who, um, in in-person uh, programs, the one or two people who've had them might raise their hand and say, well, I've had something a little more in depth. And then they would, they were willing to describe it. And it was um, doing the, uh, you know, you have to uh, draw things. It's a pen and paper and you're asked to write, uh, uh, to draw a picture of a clock and, uh, and make the hand say 3.30 uh, on the clock. And so things like that are more in depth. Um, yeah. Th that that's the thing is I don't know what tool uh, is most recommended, but I can say getting a uh, screening or and then getting any, any kind of memory test I think is helpful. If something doesn't seem right, this is this is the course of action you should start to take. Um, here in Montgomery County in the in the Washington D.C. area, we're so lucky because we have even. Uh, what's called memory clinics where people are uh, studying your memory and studying either your memory loss or non-memory loss. And so it's in Johns Hopkins. There's another one in Georgetown uh, University. And there's even uh, Kaiser Permanente here in Montgomery County who has started their own memory clinics. So trying to um, screen for memory loss more and more, I think is a, it's, yeah. it's great to just, just like blood pressure and your weight and your, uh, you know, whatever else the doctor's talking to you about, they should be talking to you about memory loss too. Okay, we're gonna go for one more question because uh, we have we have really been on for a very long time. And Sheila, I feel like we need to have you back because there's so much more that we can be talking about on this yeah. subject. So Mo asks, do you have any statistics on percentage of people under age 65 with the Alzheimer's diagnosis? And yes, thanks, Mo. And I think that's my friend Mo, right? Is that <laughs> your friend Mo? Hi, Mo. Thank you. <laughs> everyone's friend Mo. Hi, Mo. That's a great question. And I and I think I said earlier that there are a lot less people under 65 and uh, that have Alzheimer's disease in the U.S. than there are over. So um, over 65, I'll just start with that. It's 5.6 million people are affected with Alzheimer's disease just in the U.S. Yeah, it's wow. a huge disease. And then um, under 65 for the younger onset is what we call it. It's, it's less than 250,000 people. So um, that it's, it's, it's a lot less, uh, but but what I have to say, even though the numbers are smaller, I think it's it the whole disease is is a tragedy. It's a it's a horrible uh, progressive brain disease, but the younger you are, I think the worse it is because of your responsibilities and because of your your life. Of course, uh, we we don't want to be struck with this disease any earlier than we have to be, and that's our hope at the Alzheimer's uh, Association. If we could. Uh, of course, find the cure. We would love that. I would love to do a program on the cure for Alzheimer's disease and come back and tell I you that. Can't wait for Wouldn't us that be wonderful? And I hope, I hope I hope I do that. But but I really like to, to even tell you about better drugs and things that we could uh, take when we see when we're screened for this disease and we see that something's not wrong. Maybe there's a disease that can or a drug that can push the disease off later. You know, so if I'm fit, affected in my 50s now let's try to be on this drug and, and push it off as long as possible. So that may be what I, what I come back to say one day too. I hope, I hope I will. Me too. Okay. I said one more, but I, I, <laughs> have to, um, I do, I did just see something in the chat field uh, for Vera. She says it is very important to state that there is no scientific evidence supporting the flu shot, increasing risk for Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, there have been studies indicating that people who receive flu vaccine have a lower risk of dementia. So I don't know about those studies, but I will say this, our older population is the most susceptible to having adverse um, outcomes if they do have the flu. So it sounds like a risk benefit almost. Mm. Do you want to speak to that or... I don't know. And, you know, I wrote it down as something I really want to be able to know more about. Uh, but I think, you know, getting the flu is a difficult thing for anybody uh, over a certain age, you know, 85. And as you said, it's, it, you know, everything's a risk. And uh, I was yesterday talking to some of my neighbors had a little impromptu uh, happy hour out front and social distancing. And we were talking about, so in the future, we'll have to get a flu shot, a pneumonia shot, a shingle shot, and a COVID okay. shot, right? <laughs> so, Shoot me up. <laughs> I know. We were like, wow, you might be right. And uh, so we have to be careful, of course, of everything we're doing. Yeah. We have to yeah. really have a lot of information and, and trust our doctors and talk with our doctors. But uh, you know, I'd, I'd hate for the flu shot to actually be detrimental to people. I, I hope that, right. you know, I, I, but I can't, I don't know enough about it. So Sheila, one thing that I do need you to do, if you wouldn't mind putting your email also in the Q and A box. Okay, great. Uh, because there are a lot of questions and I know that people are asking about what about social day programs. Oh, um, perfect. So yeah, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, uh, because those are in the Q&A, rather than in the uh, chat box. And then I am just going to share my screen really quickly as we head on out. Um, First off, Sheila, wow, this has been amazing. Such great information. And I really do appreciate you coming on with us again. Uh, I mean, I, I want you to come on again. This is really <laughs> great. Brain Health Month, by the way. So it was perfect timing to have Sheila with us. And we definitely need to schedule um, a follow up because, again, there's so many different things to talk about and there's so much research being done and uh, really, really good stuff. I thank you so much. Uh, we are here to help as always visiting Angel. We are where you are. So check us out online. If you'd like a free home care consultation with us, that's the number to call. And with that, I believe our time here is up. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. Take care, everybody.